The 1967 Red Sox were 100 to 1 long shots to win the pennant. But Dick Williams went into the season with a grandiose plan. The classic line uh, of Dick Williams is here's a guy who has only managed two years, period, in you know, minor leagues, uh, walking in and telling the Boston press that's just seen a, a dismal team play the year before that they're going to win more than they're going to lose. I honestly think we'll win more ballgames than we lose. And he guaranteed it. You know, it's like a Joe Namath walking out and saying, we're going to beat the Baltimore Colts, you know. And everybody go, ha, 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 right, someday. I thought we had a good enough ball club to play a little better than 500. And maybe I was whistling by a graveyard. I don't know. What no one knew yet was that Carl Yastrzemski was about to transform into a power hitter. Number nine helped him a little bit. Ted Williams had an idea that you can be that kind of hitter and the upward swing and the, the, the hips that Yastrzemski wasn't any of this uh, hitting down at the ball and trying to drive line drives that they did need somebody and he ended up with 44 home runs that year and I can remember 42 of those home runs meant something they either won ball games or tied ball games or brought us back into the ball game Yaz had the type of year that every ball player dreams of as one of 12 players this century to win the triple crown Yaz would chalk up 44 homers, 121 RBIs, and hit 326. He was the toast of a pennant feverish New England. Carl Yastrzemski, Carl Yastrzemski, Carl Yastrzemski, the man they call Yaz. When you're in a groove, you just walk up to the batter's box, you don't worry about your feet, your legs, your arms. You're standing there, come on, throw the ball, let's go. When number eight is standing at the plate, and any swing, I've never watched a player have a year like that before or since. Uh, it's the best player I have ever watched play the game for one solid year. We love him so in Boston. We all know that when he swings, yeah, here we go again. It seemed like every time we needed a, a two runs, the was coming up. And they pitched to him. That's the, most, the biggest shock. I couldn't understand why people kept pitching to him. We, ke we kept wondering why the, the opposing pitchers kept pitching to him. There was many situations that I said, if I was pitching, I would walk yes. He beat teams time and time again, and it was just like they didn't believe that Kari Ostrimski was hitting all these home runs and knocking in all these runs. In the beginning, before Tony got hit, you know, it was just unbelievable to watch both of them because Tony was the same way. Tony loved to hit in those situations, and he'd always come through. Tony was Tony Canigliero, Boston's hometown hero, who was in the midst of his fourth straight 20 home run season when he was tragically beamed on August 18th. He was an awesome talent. Uh, Tony C. would have, he, he would have owned this, this city maybe if he had stayed healthy. And the way it happened, I think it was, it was, it was a sick feeling. The effect it had on us, uh, obviously for the immediate thing, we said, well, we, we've probably lost someone here that, that uh, would probably knock us out of a win. It didn't work that way. We, we, uh, we took that more as, a, let's say, something that would spur us on. Uh, you know, we really wanted to win, and it was just a shame he couldn't have been, uh, been there with us. Despite Conigliero's loss, the Sox went into first place in late August, a near miracle for a team that hadn't been in contention for 18 years. But the Minnesota Twins were a mere half game behind the Red Sox in what was becoming the tightest American League race in decades. In fact, one and a half games separated the top four teams as late as September 28th. While the Twins were breathing down Boston's neck, so were the Chicago White Sox, a pitching-rich team that last went to the World Series in 1959. These Sox didn't have quite the same go-go style as that team, but behind Joe Horland, their pitching carried them. Then, too, there were the Detroit Tigers, whose powerhouse lineup kept them in the thick of the race, a race that back in April no one expected the young Red Sox to be in. After all, they finished a half game out of last place the year before and were pretty much the same team. As the season went on in 1967, when you would have thought the, the pressure would build, 
I felt that uh, everything we did was just a plus, and that uh, no matter if we fell one game short or ten games short, everybody had been just so excited about the season, uh, we couldn't lose. We were, we were the heroes, and, and that was it. The season came down to the final two games against the Twins. The Red Sox were one game behind, and they had to win both. I know that going into those last few games, it, it never entered our mind whatsoever to lose. And I guess you get start believing some of the, the ink that they're writing about you about the impossible dream. Boston, the Fenway Park is the setting for the two-day finale of the tightest American League race in history. Vice President Humphrey of Minnesota and Senator Edward Kennedy of Massachusetts are set to cheer the Twins and Red Sox respectively. Boston must win two from Minnesota. In the seventh inning, Carl Yastrzemski blasts a three-run homer to give the Red Sox victory six to four. Yaz ultimately winds up with a triple crown in batting. I would have never won the Triple Crown in 67 if we weren't involved in the pennant race because we weren't thinking about winning the Triple Crown. You were going to the plate, taking one at bat at a time and hitting what the situation called for to help win a ball game. With the Red Sox, Twins, and Tigers in a virtual tie for the pennant, one more Boston victory coupled with one Detroit loss would bring the bunting to Beantown and its fans. And so, with one game to decide the pennant, Minnesota's ace, Dean Chance, was going against Boston's ace, Jim Lonborg. It might be a little kid's dream to, to be on the mound for the final game of a season, a, a, a game that you have to win uh, to go on to the World Series. Boston started out the game tight. The Twins scored two early runs, but in the sixth, Lonborg surprised everyone. As I walked up to home plate, I took a glance down the third baseline uh, where Cesar Tovar, I think, was playing. And he was playing back quite a bit. I mean, he just figures, here's a pitcher coming up. And I, the thought just occurred to me that I can lay down a bunt and I can beat it out. Good bunt. And he can't play it. A bunt single for Lonborg to lead off the sixth inning. On the next three consecutive pitches, uh, we got base hits. And this is a base hit to center. Swinging away. Base hit to left. Lonborg being held at third base, and they're loaded up. Base hit to center. Lonborg scores. Adair will score. It's tied up. The Sox kept up their momentum. They took the lead on Ken Harrelson's bouncer to short. And then a wild pitch brought home Yastrzemski with an insurance run. The drama continued into the ninth. The lead was still two runs as all of New England prayed with every pitch. Little soft pop-up. Petroselli will take it. He does. The ball game is over. The Red Sox win it. Within seconds, we were all there together as teammates. And then seconds after that, the people came on the field. For some reason, it seemed like a good thing to do just to stay on the field and enjoy the moment because it really, we had done it. But the more I stayed on the field, the more I realized that I didn't know any of these people that were surrounding me. And we were headed towards right field. And then all of a sudden, it got scary because they were going to right field. And I wanted to go back to the clubhouse. Once in the clubhouse, the Red Sox waited for the outcome of the second game of the Tigers-Angels doubleheader. If the Tigers lost, the pennant would belong to Boston. We had to sit and listen to the radio, and it was just as tense listening to that radio as probably playing the game itself uh, against the Twins. Then as the game started to progress and outs were being made and more and more cheers, the crescendo of the whole thing built up. I'll never forget it because Dick McAuliffe uh, hit into a game-ending double play. His first double play of the season. Game's over, and we're the champions. And then all hell broke loose when McAuliffe hit into that double play. That's the way the season ended for us, and uh, unfortunately, I had to be the one to hit into the double play. And I heard later on that I could hear all the cheers in the uh, Red Sox clubhouse after the game, you know, once I hit into the double play, and I thought that they were the champs of the American League. I don't think we realized that we had won the pennant until we actually were in the, 
World Series with the Cardinals, you know, it's like some dream. Uh, and then uh, when the season was over, uh, we knew we accomplished something.